All right, now uh, keep your homework handy. It is something that we will spend uh, some time talking about. I would imagine that you may want to actually see some of them. Um, but how about this, this kind of little flashback from last year? Do you remember how to factor it? That's actually a hint. Do you remember how to solve it? What did you kind of learn? How do you explain this to someone? This is a trinomial, okay? That's mathy talk, but a trinomial is when you have like three terms. And the first term is squared, the second term is not, we call that linear, and then we have a constant. Okay, so when you factor something like that, you're actually reverse foiling. You're reverse foiling. And so remember, we're trying to come up with numbers that do two things. They have to multiply to be four, start over, they have to multiply to be eight, and add to be six. Does that sound like, like a little familiar puzzle? Numbers that multiply to be eight, but add to be six, would be yeah. four and two. Good, that's why I accidentally said four, but we get four and two. We call it x plus four, x plus two. And then you just solve, right? You solve each of those little factors, kind of like we did yesterday. So one of the answers, at least for the first factor, would be not four, but it would be negative four, right? And then the other one, of course, is negative two. So why is that problem up on the screen? Are we trying to get ready for like the SAT or something? Um, not directly, but actually the reason this problem's up here is so you can do a trig factoring. So you can do a trig factoring. Now, I'm going to encourage you on your notes from yesterday to put this in the factoring quadrant. Remember, we only had one example. If you want to have your notes kind of be organized, then this problem was meant to be put into that factoring box, probably the upper right corner. Now, try not to let the cosines blow you away, but rather notice that this is just another trinomial. But instead of using x squared, we use cosine squared. Again, instead of using x, we use cosine. So could you write this like a reverse foil? You know, could you come up with parentheses? that had numbers that still multiplied to be six and added to be seven. Uh, do you see those same numbers? We still have this idea of multiply to be six and add to be seven. And maybe I should say, so then what will your parentheses look like? Good, cosine plus six, cosine plus one. And by the way, it could have been the other way, right? It could be cosine plus one. It could be cosine plus six. You could reverse it. Now, sit on this with me just for a moment. Do you realize what we're doing? It's the same thing, except now the variable is cosine of theta. It's the only difference, okay? The variable is, oh, I changed it to x, but it doesn't matter. It could be the cosine of x or the cosine of theta. Could you solve this? Could you solve this? I hope you say yes. Remember, to solve that, you're just going to take the inverse of negative one. You, on your calculator, you're gonna do the inverse of negative one. Let's make sure that that's working for you. Probably wanna take out a calculator anyway. Are you guys okay? I'm doing a little bit of math in my head. Basically, we're subtracting one. When you subtract one from both sides, that's why you now have negative one. But you do the inverse of negative one. And you get an angle. 
Okay, it actually looks like an angle. You get 180. So that's one of our solutions. The other one, though, I think we're going to have to do the inverse of negative 6, right? Huh. How's that going for you? Shouldn't be going too well. You can't do the inverse of negative 6 because of a little theory. The theory is that these numbers have to be on the unit circle. And although we haven't talked about the unit circle in quite some time, you still love the unit circle? Thank you. But remember, those numbers have to be numbers that are within the unit circle. That means they have to be less than 1. So you're never going to be able to do the inverse of a number that's outside of that unit circle. So whether it's 6 or negative 6, okay, you basically end up with undefined for that one. But again, this one is good. And this is okay. Like, this is what happens. You, you still got an answer. You still got 180. You just can't do the inverse when the number is outside of the unit circle. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. I wanted to kind of preview that and have you put it in your notes. Um, that is a different type of factoring. Sometimes kids call it like a foil factoring. Now, um, am I kind of thinking that you guys may want to talk about some of the homework problems? Well, if you do, you've come to the right place. I'm more than happy to, to sort of work out some stuff, but it looks like that I'm showing you some of that. I anticipated that some students would have a question on number six. If you took my hint correctly, you divided both sides by cosine squared. Now, after you do that, you just get the number three, which is nice, but you also get sine squared over cosine squared, which is also nice because that equals tangent squared. And what did I do? Good. Yeah, we can. We'll go over number eight also. Oh, for number two, I got positive and negative. Oh, did I miss maybe like the plus or minus? It's very possible. Okay. So here, let's let's uh, talk about eight, and then we'll go back figure out what happened with two. It could be another teacher miss mistype. Um, Number eight, it almost looks a little bit more like a proof. And uh, although you're not proving it, you are kind of working out some common denominators. Uh, let's see here. Tangent change in the sine over cosine. Um, why did we do that? Well, we're trying to kind of pull this all together, honestly. Uh, now, sine times sine will give you sine squared over that denominator of cosine. At this point right here, I need a common denominator. So what I do is I put a cosine down here. So I just put that there. But that means I have to put another one in the top. And since I now have another one in the top, I have a cosine squared up there. Sine squared plus cosine squared, the numerators will equal 1 over your common denominator. You guys actually did do a proof like this. Some of you might be saying, this looks like something I did in the proof party. Okay, But even if you're not saying that, um, rest assured that it uses those ideas. Now, 1 over cosine, 1 over cosine, I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is move cosine over to this side. So I multiplied cosine over here because I don't want it in the denominator. And then I divided 2 over here. I kind of did a little switcheroo. Okay, so that's why cosine all of a sudden equals a half. And you do a little inverse and you get 60. Now, number um, I'm pretty sure that my answer is right, but I, let's still talk about it, okay, which is why we're here. Can you guys see that? Okay. 
Um, subtract 1, divide by root 2. I'm going to do the, both those steps kind of in one step. So subtract 1, divide by root 2. Now, here's the thing. I never took the square root of both sides. You see, when you take the square root of both sides, that's when you get a plus or minus. So I happen to have a square root, and I'm glad you asked because there's a little difference here. I have a square root, but that's different than taking a square root. So we'll just be able to do the inverse of, well, one negative one over root two. You can just type that in your calculator. It's a little fancy. Try to type it in. I'll, I'll let you know. If, I'll help you if you're having trouble. But that's why you get negative 45 only. What else? We can go over one of them that's even or odd. What else? Go ahead. When I look at a problem like this, I see a repeated trig function. I see tangent and then more tangent. If there's something repeated, you want to think about factoring. Okay, but to factor, I need my equation to equal zero. So I'm going to take this tangent and I'm going to subtract it over here. We're going to subtract tangent to the other side. Now look that basically be careful because I didn't somehow try to combine those tangents. You know, like try to subtract those tangents to somehow like become maybe tangent squared. Right now, all I did was just subtract them and put them beside each other. Okay, because now that they're repeated, I can factor out that one tangent. It's a little different factoring because I'm left with a tangent squared. I'm still left with the number 3, but I am left with a minus 1. Each of these is going to solve equal to 0. This one will solve equal to 0, kind of like tangent equals 0. And then this one will solve equal to 0. Now this one in itself is a little math problem because if that's equal to zero, I got to add one, I got to divide by three. So tangent squared equals one third. Now we're going to take a square root. Now we're going to get a plus or minus. Okay, it's going to be tangent equaling plus or minus the square root of one third. And then I'll have to do the inverse on my calculator of two numbers. Some of the problems on the homework were kind of like one step beyond what I did in the notes. I'm trying to give you guys a little taste of what I want you to be able to do. Sometimes, you know, we give it to you and then we can go over it. Um, Chase, I actually want to type this in because even for myself, it's like, how do you type this in? It's the inverse of root one third. Okay, so I still have a root sign, I have a one third, and then trying to type in the negative to keep all that organized. You guys are asking the right questions. Is there something else? Are you sure? What I want to do today is I want to basically continue this conversation. That is, we're going to keep solving equations. Some of them are going to use some of that FOIL factoring that I, uh, we previewed at the beginning of the period. Some of them are just going to be like what we did yesterday. But let's spend another day talking about solving some of these. Let's do one more of these FOIL factoring. Sometimes it's just recognizing, hey, I, I have a trinomial. And if you have a trinomial, well, the, the classes and the math that you've learned in the past, we want you to continue to use this year. And so I'm kind of saying nicely, I, I, want, I expect that you still know this, but sometimes it requires a little review. 
You're just looking for numbers that multiply to be 6 and add to be negative 5. And it's like a little puzzle. Numbers that multiply to be 6 and add to be negative 5 would be negative 3 and negative 2. And so you just factored that trinomial. Factoring is when you split something up. Now, these are supposed to be a little bit easier because, well, your answer just ends up being the opposite. So technically, the answer is 3 and 2. But the reason we're, real reason we're doing those problems is so we can try to do it with sine and cosine. So when you see something like cosine squared minus 3 cosine plus 2, you want to also think FOIL factor. The only difference here is that instead of using x and x, we use cosine and cosine. But you're still looking for numbers that multiply to be 2 and add to be negative 3. And of course, that would have to be minus 2 and minus 1. Now remember, when you have a problem that's factored, it's kind of like you have two problems that you have to solve. And I, I said this a little bit yesterday, and I'm still fine with it today. You can do this on your calculator as long as you understand that what you're really doing on your calculator is the inverse of not negative 2, but the inverse of 2. But if you were listening a few moments ago, that's never going to work. So you can save yourself 15 seconds of time, and you can just say, that's never going to work. This one, well, you would be doing the inverse of 1, and that is going to work. Okay, so similar to yesterday, similar, but with FOIL factoring. Let's do another problem. Um, this is more of like a teaching problem. Uh, I don't know if I would expect you to get this right and completely without some teach, without some guidance, but um, let's see what we got. Be careful that you don't jump the gun and say FOIL factor. It, it shouldn't look like it's factorable because there's two different variables. There's a cosine and a sine. So not, not yet. But I do want you to look at this cosine squared and kind of study that a little bit and realize that that cosine squared can turn into a sine. Now this requires some like level two, level three thinking, but you have to realize that if I'm gonna solve this problem, I need everything to be the same. And again, the cosine squared can turn into a sine squared. Well, one minus sine squared. Okay, and of course, that's the little trick to this problem because now everything is signs. Now, that's good because when everything is signs, we should be able to use some of the strategies that we've been learning, like maybe factor it or, I don't know, let's see what happens. I think you have to do the distributive property here. Yes, you have to do the distributive property that gives you the ability to kind of split this up. The other thing that you have to notice in this problem is that it is destined to turn into a trinomial. The reason it's destined to be a trinomial is because once I add these like terms, the like terms are just 2 minus 1. So once I do that, okay, 2 minus 1 is just 1. Now, this equation is looking like, again, a trinomial. What's a trinomial? It's got three terms. One of them squared. The next one is not. And then you have that lonely number out there. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to factor when the first number is negative. You thought I was just going to say I don't like to factor. But I don't like to factor when the first number is negative. So instead of trying to figure this out, let's multiply the entire equation by a negative 1. That's totally legit. If I multiply the equation by a negative 1, basically all the signs change. And it really does make it a lot easier to factor. Okay, I just did a little bit of a switcheroo there. I multiplied it, and now we have a positive 2. Sine squared, a positive sine, and a negative 1.
Now, this would be one of those trinomials that you would have had to think about a little bit more last year. You might have used like a British method, or maybe you just would have used a little guess and check because we have this two right here. You, you can't ignore the fact that we have a two. So it's two sine and a sine. Okay, now I want my numbers to multiply to be negative one. The only numbers that multiply to be negative one are still some type of one and negative one. But the question is which one is the negative and which one's the positive. Remember that whatever number you put out here is going to get multiplied by two sine. And whatever number I put right here is just going to get multiplied by sine. I want these two blue arrows. I want these two blue arrows to check up to be this sign in the middle. And that means that the one out here is the positive, And that means that this one here on the left is the negative. We're going to end up with a plus one here and a minus one here. Okay, now once we get this thing factored, then we can uh, solve and make sure that when you're solving each of these that you realize that uh, both of them require us to think about setting it equal to zero. And some of you will do this in your head. That's fine. If you set that equal to zero, you'll add one and divide by two. That's one half. So you'll take the inverse of one half. That's a calculator thing. Take the inverse of one half. I can tell you that that comes out to be 30. And then this one right here, I'll actually be taking the inverse of negative one. The inverse of negative one is 90. That is a tough problem. I don't want to make an excuse and say you won't have to learn that, but I'm just being honest. It's a little tougher. If you look at how it started, we had to switch the cosine squared, and then we got busy with this FOIL factoring. Okay, but I, I want you to grow into that type of problem, and I have to show it to you at least one time before you can start to think about it on your own. Let's do one more, and it's actually a little easier on purpose. I don't want you to think every problem is factoring. I want you to start to use like all of your tools. And yesterday I showed you a tool. If you remember, it didn't work, but today it does work. I want you to be thinking about dividing. Uh, maybe I should say like smart dividing. Any thoughts about what you could divide by? There's lots of things out there. It's a trick function. You could divide by Now if you didn't if you weren't able to predict what I was going to divide by, okay, let's make sure you understand why. Like why would I decide to divide by cosine? What does that do for us? It changes everything to be one trick function. Particularly, it changes sine over cosine now to be tangent. But everything else, everything else kind of disappears and we have one trick function. Now, that's like a, that's a, that's a popular strategy. That's something like for every problem, you want to be thinking, how can I have one trick function? And sometimes dividing by just the right thing will get the job done. Now, as sometimes students will say, how am I supposed to know to do that? Well, maybe you'll recognize that it's similar to what I did here. If you look at this paper, I have some hints. Hints are okay. So sometimes you look at the hints and it will kind of help you get started. I want you to have a little bit of time to do that. I want you to have some time to try to solve some equations on your own and use the time that we have to practice some of these, maybe get some help from me, check your answers on the back. I believe I do have some answers back there. Keep growing, okay? Keep growing with these equations.